We're turning to our message now. Uh, last night, it's a shorter one this morning. Last night as I was preparing, I prepared pretty late, and I was thinking about the week of fasting and prayer and starting, and my body, which is very powerful, started telling me, Jennifer, you're hungry. You're hungry. You're really hungry. My stomach was growling. I wasn't... It, it wasn't even fasting and prayer week yet. My stomach was growling. I thought, I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. And as it got closer, I thought, oh, fasting. And I thought, Lord, that's not the right attitude at all. God, I want to have the right attitude and the right heart. And we want to join together in fasting and prayer. We want to encourage one another. You can encourage your sisters and brothers in the Lord that you can do it. And God will help you because this pleases Him. Amen? Amen. 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 And after I told my body, too bad, we're going to fast. Guess what? I haven't been hungry since then. <laughs> but the Lord will help us. The Lord will help us. And we'll go through times of physical difficulty, but the Lord will help us, and He will meet us spiritually. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to the Word of the Lord this morning, and as we do, um, we're going to talk this morning about, uh, just for a short time, about a worthy life a worthy life. And you'll find this morning that this will be somewhat similar to what Pastor Renee spoke on last week. Pastor Renee spoke on uh, living a life without regrets, right? And as I was preparing, I really felt like this was what the Lord, uh, the message the Lord had for us today. And I was, as I was preparing to tell you the truth, what Pastor Renee preached was not even in my thoughts. And after I'd prepared and whatever, I looked at it and I thought, I think Pastor Renee sort of talk a lot, talked about some of these things as well. But sometimes God wants us to um, God wants us to hear it more than once. So we're going to be talking this morning about a worthy life. First of all, I want to encourage you. I see about 15 of you that are yawning and about to fall asleep. So would you all stand, please? You know who you are. DJ, hit your wife. <laughs> Stretch, Sister Gurley, stretch. <laughs> okay. Some of you say, I'm not sleepy. I'm okay. I'm, I'm all right. Okay. Pat yourself. Okay. Get your holy elbow ready. If you're getting sleepy, sit next to someone and say, if I start to nod, hit me. Now have a seat. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay. We turn this morning to the Word of God. And Lord, as we turn to your Word, God, here we are. We give you our hearts. Lord, we want to, we, we give you our thoughts, our brain, Lord, every part of us. And Father, I pray that you'd help us this morning to present our bodies to you as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to you, our reasonable act of worship. Lord, help us to be alert and to receive all that you have for us today. Speak to our hearts and may we respond to your truth in the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 A worthy life, a worthy life from Ephesians 4.1. And as we're looking ahead at this new year, 2015, um, we're looking ahead as a, as a corporate, uh, for corporate fasting and prayer as a church family. Last week, Pastor Renee spoke on actually quite a, a topic that's quite similar. And this week, we're looking at a worthy life. And it's taken from Ephesians 4.1. Uh, and this is from the... Um, English Standard Version. This is the one I think Pastor Renee likes this version and uses it quite a lot. This one is a little more uh, a little more traditional in translation. This is from who wrote Ephesians? Paul. Okay, the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, and he says in Ephesians 4:1, "I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you." to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Let's look at that um, just a, a, a little more. If you have a King James Version, the King James is quite similar to this one. The New American Standard is, is quite similar to this one. And we understand it pretty well. By the way, when Paul says, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord, he in other places he says, I'm a slave of the Lord and a prisoner of the Lord. And he meant it symbolically. Uh, and he means it that way here, but in fact, Paul is in prison. And he says, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. And he's talking to those who are not behind bars. And he says, I urge you. And the word urge is really strong. It's not just, come on, let's do it. But the word means implore or to plead with or to beg. And he says, I, I beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. 
So this is a very literal translation of the Greek, but I want us to put it in a little more contemporary language this morning, okay? So let's put it um, in a little more contemporary language. Let's look at the next slide. And so walk in a way and walk the literal translation uh, of the Greek. It's a literal translation of the Greek, and that's what it actually means, to walk. And so here we have, uh, here's something for us just to think about it. Walk in a way, and that's the very literal translation. But I have a question for you. You already know the answer. Joshua, does that mean, as Christians, that we have a special way of walking? As we walk down the street, you'll see somebody walking, you'll say, mm, that person's a Christian because they walk a certain way. <laughs> Is that what that means? Y yes or no, Joshua? No, okay. Joshua is a young youth, but he already knows the answer to that one. It doesn't mean there's a literal way of walking, although, by the way, brothers and sisters, I have seen people walking literally before, and I have thought, they're not walking like a Christian. You know what I mean? We do think about that sometimes. That's the literal translation, but the literal is not how Paul is using it here, and it was also often used symbolically as well. And the Greek word that Paul uses here actually means what? It actually means to live a life, okay? So to live a life or to live your life, and it means the way a person behaves, the way a person acts, it means what their lives are like. So this, so when Paul says that, he says the way that you live your life. So it's not how you walk down the street, but it's the way that you live your life. And what he says is, I beg you, I urge you, live your life in a worthy way, in a worthy way. So let's look at some modern translations then, and um, that give that give us another, that give us some other uh, some other translations. Okay, let's look at the next slide, and we see uh, the first one is from the Phillips paraphrase, and I really like this one, but it's, it's a paraphrase, not a translation. As God's prisoner then, I beg you to live lives worthy of your high calling. Okay, so that's a paraphrase, one of my favorites. Worthy of your high calling. The New Living says, Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. There's the next one. And then the NIV, which is what we're going to look at mostly this morning. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And any one of these, when we look at any of these translations, it immediately we say, okay, I understand exactly what is being, uh, what is, is um, what Paul is saying. So let's use the NIV. Next slide. So therefore, I urge you to live a life worthy of of the calling that you've received. I've put therefore in parentheses because therefore is not in the NIV, but NIV translates it then, but the meaning is the same as this. So hang on to that because that word is going to be very important just a little bit later. Now, I have some questions for you this morning. Look at this, and when I, for me, when I look at this, I immediately have some questions. If Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says to you and to me, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received, what are some questions that immediately come to mind? Anybody? Think about that. Look at that, look at that verse. What are some questions that come to mind? What? Okay, no, what's a question though? Okay, not what does, not exactly what the verse means, but what are some questions that you have about it? If you read this verse, what questions do you have? How do you live? Okay, what, how, what is a worthy life, right? How, then how do we, if Paul says, live this way, then one of the questions, probably the first question, right, is what is, what is a worthy life? How do I live a worthy life? Okay? What's another question that you might have? What is the calling? What is the calling? Okay? What is the call what is the calling? So one is what is a worthy life? What is a calling? Okay? Uh, go back to the verse just a minute. Okay? So worthy of the calling you've received. What is it what are some other questions that we might have? I know what question I have. I have a personal question when I look at this verse. Do you have a personal question? 
thank you. Am I living a worthy life? Am I living a worthy life? So I want us to consider that. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to look at these questions. First one, what is a worthy life? For the sake of time this morning, we're not going to have a lot of time to go into the high calling of God, but we'll, get, we'll touch on it just a little bit. But I'm going to encourage you during fasting and prayer to look at this this week. So the first one is, what is a worthy life? Then what, what, is, it, what is it like? Um, how do I behave? How do I act? What is that? And then the second question, which is also really important, is, am I living a worthy life? So we're going to look at these uh, we're going to look at these two. Many years, many years ago, many years ago, when I was in Form 1, so you know that was a long time ago. In America, we always called it 7th grade. I didn't call it Form 1 until I came to Hong Kong. Isn't that right? 7th grade, Form 1? Is that right? Okay. And I had a teacher, Mrs. Coleman, and she gave us tests periodically, which of course we have in school. And... Um, when you come to this first question, what is a worthy life? It's a little bit like knowing what is going to be on a test. What questions are the teacher, uh, are the teacher, is the teacher going to ask when you take a test? You have a test next week. Okay, David, you've got a test next week. Do you want to know the questions the teacher's going to ask? Do you want to know what's expected of you? Of course you do, because I know David does not want to get a C or an F. David wants an A+. Plus. He wants 100%. I know that about David. And so that first question, it's a little bit like knowing what's going to be on the test, what's expected of me. And so I had this teacher, Miss Coleman, and we knew that if we asked her long enough, she would tell us exactly the question she was going to put on the test. Instead of saying, study chapters three and four, we were really sneaky, and she was very kind-hearted. We would say, but what part of chapter three and four, Mrs. Coleman? And then we would say, do we have to know about the history of the state of Alabama? And um, from this year to this year, and she'd stand there for a while, and we'd say, do we have to know that? And after a while, she'd answer it for us. And so we would know what was expected on us, and that's a little bit what the first question is like. But the second question is, is Am I prepared for the test? So am I doing that? And so we're going to look um, at this first part, what is a worthy life? And let's look, um, to help us understand that, we're going to look at the whole letter of Ephesians. Now we're not going to, you say, how are we going to do that this morning? Trust me, we're just going to skim over part of it. But we want to look at the first three chapters of Ephesians. And when we look at chapters 1, 2, and 3, Paul is writing about the wonderful things that God has done for us. Here's this verse, Ephesians 4, 1, and Ephesians 4, 1 is right in the middle of the letter of the Ephesians. You've got six chapters in Ephesians, and they're 1, 2, 3, and then there's a break, and you've got 4, 5, and 6, and there's a division between the two chapters. And Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, begins chapter 4 by saying, therefore, Oh, therefore, it points back to chapters 1, 2, and 3. I urge you to live a worthy life. And so we're going to look at the first three chapters. I encourage you, if your faith is weak, if your confidence is shaky in the Lord, I encourage you to go to Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 are some of the most wonderful chapters in all of the New Testament because they talk about what God has done for us. So I want us to look at some of the high points. There's many, many more than this. We go to the next one. So, uh, sorry, I'll put that back up just one more time. So as a prisoner, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. So DJ said, what's the calling? And here is part of the calling. So the calling you've received. Who has called you? I haven't called you to be a Christian. Your parents haven't called you to be a Christian. A friend hasn't called you to be a Christian. And that's something you need to know as you walk with the Lord. Because if you set your eyes on other people, other people will fail you. They will disappoint you. They will not do it right sometimes. They will live less than they should at some times. And every once in a while, people that influenced your life 
for the Lord will walk away from the Lord. Have you seen that before? I've seen it before. I've seen it before. People that I respected and admired, some of them personally, some of them just through their teachings or their writings, failed God. And some of them repented and came back to God. And others of them walked away from God and have never come back to the Lord. And that is when, as a Christian, I need to know that that person didn't call me to follow the Lord. That di person didn't give me my calling. Instead, my calling has come from whom? It's come from God. It's come from God. There are all sorts of verses in the New Testament. He's called us out of darkness. And there are other ones. Paul says, I press towards the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's in Philippians 3, 14, the verse that we know so very well. And others as well. Our calling comes from the Lord. Young people, sometimes you will look at your parents and your parents may not get it right. Your parents will not be perfect. And at times like that, instead of saying, well, I thought they were Christians and getting shaken, and judging them, that is when you remind yourself, God is the one who's called me. God is the one who's called me. And so, God, I look to you, and I'll never be shaken. Now, let's go back to Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, and let's look at some high points, the calling that we've received, what God has done for us. There will be more than you can write down, so what you need to do is say Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 in your notes. Let's look at some of them. In Ephesians 1, 3... Let's go to the next slide. The first one, let's look at one of the things that God has done. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. All that we need. Much, much later, do you know what Paul writes? Paul writes, he has given us all we need for life and godliness. Oh, Peter, sorry, Peter writes. Did I say Peter or did I say Paul? I said Peter, right? Peter writes that. And Paul writes what? He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Look at 1-4. Even before he made the world, God loved us. Do you question the love of God for you sometimes? You feel like I'm not worthy? You feel like I'm not whatever? God set a plan in motion before the world began. I love you so much. Before you were born, before you existed, before your parents were born, before they had any idea we're going to have a child and you came into the world, God knew you. He saw your face. He saw your face, Brother Alfred. He knew what you were going to look like. And you know what he said? I love Alfred. I set my love upon him and I'm going to give him Jesus so that he can come to know me and to know my love for him. That's the kind of love that God has for us. But not, out, not only that, in, one, in verse 5 of chapter 1, he decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad he did that? He decided to adopt you. He decided to adopt you. What else do we see? He's so rich in kindness and grace, he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son, and he forgave our sins. He's so rich and so full of grace. But that's not all he did. In verse 8, he has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. You know, there's a Chinese expression sometimes when somebody is, somebody, when somebody is kind of xiao qi, you know? When they're kind of... Sometimes we would say they're a little bit stingy. They're a little bit. It means they're a little bit small-hearted. Their heart, their heart is small. Their heart's not very big. Have you ever been around people that are not very generous? Have you ever been like around people like that? Don't you just love to be about around people like that? They're your favorite people, right? No, I hate to be around people who are not generous. I really, I really don't like it. And when I'm around it, I just think, oh Lord, please help me. I don't want to be like that. I want to be generous. I want to have a big heart. Lord, whether I have a lot or a little, I want to be generous because that's how God is. Well, here is God. Here's this beautiful picture. He showered his kindness on us. And the verse before that, he's so rich in kindness that he did this for us. Here are some of the calling of God in our life. What else do we see? In verse 13, when you believed in Christ, 
He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. When you said, I believe in you, do you know what God said immediately? You're mine. You're mine. You belong to me. You're part of my family. Sometimes we feel like we don't belong, don't we? Sometimes we feel sort of like orphans, and there may be some of you this morning who are orphans, or maybe one, or one parent is gone or whatever, and sometimes we kind of feel like, oh, where do I fit, and where do I belong? I want to tell you something this morning, or you are far, there are some of you this morning that are far from your home countries, and you're not really treated very well or honored very well in this country as well, and you're just kind of stuck, and you kind of feel like, oh, where do I belong? What, who am I? I want you to know that you're a child of God and you belong in His family. He has identified you and He has adopted you into His family. What else? He says, what has He done in the next one? He's given us His Holy Spirit. And then what else do we see? Then in chapter 2, the next one. One time you were dead, but God is so rich in mercy. Oh, here again. Here's this God who's so rich, so rich in mercy that what did He do? He gave us life. He gave us life. Let's look at a few more. The next one. We're God's masterpiece. Uh, next slide. Keep going. God's masterpiece. He created us in Christ Jesus to do good works. What's next? One time you were far away from God, but you've been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. That's 2.13. 2.19. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. You're members of God's family. I still remember many, many years ago when Sister Betty and I were in China, um, and you know I'm an American citizen, and um, it was after June 4th, after the crackdown in Tiananmen Square in 1989, and Sister Betty and I talked about becoming Chinese citizens. We really did. Isn't that, isn't that foolish? Not that China, and I don't, that's not a, not that China is not a great nation. I, that's not, that's not the point that I'm making. But we considered, well, let's not, if, because we were afraid that, because we didn't know what would happen, we were afraid they may kick us out of the country and we can't come back. And we were there because God had called us and we wanted people to know God's love. That's why we were there. And we thought, what if they kick, especially Americans, what if they kick Americans out of China and we can't get back in? And so Betty and I talked and talked and talked about, well, maybe, maybe we should, we, maybe we will become Chinese citizens. So they can't kick us out. How foolish was that? We didn't think very clearly, did we? How foolish was that? But you know what we found out? We found out we had very good friends. You know what we found out? We couldn't become Chinese citizens. <laughs> we, we said, what? And they said, no, you're American. You can't be a Chinese citizen. You weren't, you, weren't born, you weren't born in China, and you weren't born Chinese. You can't be a Chinese citizen. And so we gave up that idea, and that was the Lord, and that was a good thing. But I love this picture. You know, we think of things like that. And some of you, um, I'm now a, a permanent resident of Hong Kong, and so I'm a Hong Konger, but I'm also an American as well. But my first identity, my first identity is a child of God. I'm in the family of God. And we see this, we're citizens along with all of God's holy people. I am citizens of the country and the kingdom and the city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. And it will never end. And so are you. When you feel like you don't belong, when you feel stuck, when you feel, where is my home? Look upward, for we are citizens of heaven. 3.12 says what? Because of Christ and our faith, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. How many of you are from a Catholic background where traditionally you would go to a priest to confess your sins? How many of you? Many of you, Pastor, that was Pastor Renee's background as well. And many of you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think about going boldly and confidently into the presence of God, would you? Instead, you'd go to the priest, and the priest would pray to God for you, right? But Paul tells us what? He says, because of Christ, you can confidently 
and boldly go into the presence of God. This is what God has done, and this is his high calling. And then we come to 320, and this is one of my favorites, and a little bit later we'll come back to this one. All glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we can ask or think. Infinitely more. God can do more. That's in chapter 3, verse 20. God can do more in you than you can imagine. God can do more in you than you can ever hope for. Aren't these verses encouraging? Aren't they wonderful? This is the calling of God in our lives. This is the calling that He has called us to. No wonder, no wonder Paul says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. All of the wonderful things that God has for us. And in chapters 1, 2, and 3, that's the calling of God. That's God's part. That's what He's done. And that is why, when we look at Ephesians 4, 1 again, let's go to the next slide, that is why Paul says, Therefore, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Because of what we read in chapters 1, in chapters 2, and in chapters 3, well, then we understand, oh, this is what God is calling me to. This is the life that He has for me. And so what Paul says is, because God has done that, I urge you now, because of that, therefore, I urge you to live a worthy life. God has done His part. Now, very, very quickly, let's look at our part. Let's look at the next slide, slide 11, and because of time, we're going to skate through this. So let's look at some things. What is our part? What does the worthy life look like, okay? What does the worthy life look like? Number one, humble and gentle patience. I want to ask you something. Just the very first one. How many of you are patient with your brothers and sisters when they blow it, when they make a mistake because of all the love in your heart that God has put there? Yes? Don't answer that question. <laughs> if, you say, if you answered yes, then maybe you need to pray for more humility as well. Or maybe you've really, really advanced in the Lord. But this is what a worthy life this is one of the things that a worthy life looks like. What else? We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Verse 26, we're not going to let sin control us. Uh, we're not going to let anger control us. How many of you, anger never controls you? Never. You keep even tempered and calm. You never lose your temper with other people. Anger doesn't control you. Mm. Mm. I had trouble with that one this week with people I didn't even know, but I won't go into it. <laughs> I'll save it for another time. I really did. I was so, I was, I, I was so angry about something. People were mistreating animals, and I, it made me, I know, I know you, I'm sorry, you all laugh. I don't laugh at that. It really, it was breaking my heart. It was really, and I was like, oh, I, I was so angry. If I, if I could have done something, I would have, and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. It was behind a wall. But anger truly gripped my heart. I, it, it really, really did. And when anger gets a hold of our hearts, it's hard, to let it, it's hard to, for it to let go, isn't it? And some of you are nodding because you know how it is. When it sinks its claws into our hearts, it's hard to get it out. But that is what a worthy life looks like. That's what a worthy life looks like. What else? In verse 28, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously. Oh, I don't mind working hard, but I want to spend it on me. But the Bible says a worthy life gives generously to others. How about your language? Verse 29, don't use foul or abusive language. That's a worthy life. A worthy life, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words are an encouragement. And some of us might say, well, I don't swear and I don't curse, but look at the second part of that. Is everything that you say good and helpful that encourages other people? And then what comes next? Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving. And then, verse 5-1, 
Imitate God in everything you do because you're His dear children. Next slide, very quickly. Look at what comes next. Live a life filled with love. Determine what pleases the Lord. This is a worthy life. I know I'm going fast. Some of you are trying to write it, right? That's okay. Write in your notes chapters 4, 5, and 6. And then when you pray and fast this week, go back and read and underline for yourself. This is what a worthy life looks like. What else do we see? Are you careful how you live? Are you living wisely? That's the next one. Are you making the most of your opportunities every day? Are you acting thoughtlessly or do you understand what the Lord wants you to do? How about alcohol and wine? Is it controlling your life? Is it controlling your life? And if it's controlling your life, that's not a worthy life. And you say, oh, Pastor Jen, let's not talk about things like that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. This is a worthy life. What else comes next? Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, husbands, children, parents, employees, employers. And then what comes next? All of you have been saying, yeah, 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 I got that, got that. Now, look at what comes next. Look at the next one. This is where it starts to hurt. Okay? Shall we read it together? This is taken from the words of Scripture. Let's read this part together. Okay? This is a worthy life. Ready? Okay. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Ouch. Is that how you work? This describes the employee and employer relationship. Is that how you work? Is that, that's a worthy life. That's a worthy life. And then finally, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Pray in the Spirit on all times. And this helps us. What are our prayers like? What are our prayers like? Are our prayers, that's in 618. Are our prayers all about me? Are my prayers just for myself and my family? Or are my prayers also, are my prayers also for others, praying for others as well? Then, as we look at this, here's the answer to our question. This is what a worthy life looks like. This is what a worthy, according to Paul, this is what a worthy life looks like. Uh, if you've come, you can go upstairs. Sorry, we've got some guests. If you want to, you can go up to the fourth floor and there's coffee and tea upstairs. Sorry, it's okay. We've got some, got some visitors coming in. When we look at this, we can get discouraged by how far we have to go. But I want to encourage you. Let's go to the next slide, Tian Chin. As we look at a worthy life, and then I want us, as we come near to a close this morning, I want us to look at this word, worthy, this morning. Let's go to the next slide, okay? Let's look at the word, worthy. What does the word, worthy, mean, okay? It actually means to live suitably or appropriately, okay? So what Paul says is, I want you to live appropriately because of the high calling of God, I want you to live appropriately and suitably because of the high calling of God. But let's not stop there as we come to a close this morning. I want us to close by looking at the Greek. Look at what comes next. The Greek word is axios. Axios. Okay, that's how you pronounce it. And the root meaning of the word means to balance the scales. Balance the scales. And when we say scales, how many of you, after Christmas, stood... <laughs> oh, you did it too fast, Tenshin. <laughs> how many of you stood in the bathroom on the scales and you said, Ooh, I gained three pounds at Christmas because I ate too much. Those are not the types of scales that Paul is talking about. Now you can put up the picture, okay? This is the type of scale that Paul is talking about. How many of you go to the marketplace? We don't even do this in Hong Kong anymore, do we? We do in some places. I haven't seen it so much. I used to see it in China a lot. 
I would go to the marketplace and they never had one of those scales where you just put it in and you weighed it, but they would always use that stick and they'd have a weight on this end and they'd hold it up and then they'd put my veggies, they'd put my carrots or my apples or they'd put my bai tai, my cabbage or whatever in the other one and then they would weigh it and they would balance it. And the root meaning of the word, hang with me as we come to a close this morning, the root meaning of the word worthy means to balance the scales. So, let's put it together with what Paul has said here. Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, does what? He says, in effect, God has done all of this for you. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. He has done all of this for you. That's one side of the scale. What's the other side of the scale? Us. The other side of the scale is our worthy lives because of what He has done. Our worthy lives. And isn't that encouraging? In the very middle of this chapter, Ephesians 4, 1, chapters 1, 2, and 3 on this side, 4, 5, and 6 on this side, Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, gives us a word that's a word picture to balance the scales. Here's what God has done, and here's what we are to do. We are to live a worthy life. And so I encourage you, and I challenge you, in this week ahead, let's go to the very last slide, Tenshin, the very last one. I'm skipping a whole bunch. Go to the uh, one right before that. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. We began by looking at the pictures of people's feet walking, but that's not where we end. What comes next? We follow in the footsteps of Jesus. In the balance, His life. And because of that, therefore, we too can walk worthy. Put some weight on you, the other side of the scales. God has put everything on His side. And through Him, we can put weight on the other side so that there's more of a balance so it's not just, oh, God's done everything. God's so great. Isn't that wonderful? And it's all down here. But we do our part by living a worthy life. And there's a balance in our scales. As we go through the week of fasting and prayer, ask God, God, am I living a worthy life? Go back and read Ephesians 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, and 6. You've done this for me. Now, Lord, what does my life look like because of what you've done for me. Live a worthy life. Amen? Amen? Let's close in prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you this morning that you have given us all that we need in Christ Jesus. We thank you for everything you have provided, for your riches in Jesus, for adopting us in your family, for calling us, for giving us confidence to boldly come into your presence because of Jesus, for bringing us into your family, for making us your masterpiece, for, for creating us anew, and for calling us, for calling us to yourself. Lord, I pray this week, as we wait on you and as we fast and pray, that you would help us to examine our hearts through your Holy Spirit and to live a life and to begin to live a life that is worthy, that is worthy of your calling. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Have a good week.